Well, here we are. We have finally arrived at the last chapter of the book of Revelation for Bible-believing Christians, Revelation chapter 22. And we are going to be concluding our study of Revelation chapter 22 for finding instruction in righteousness in this chapter, or oh, in the book of Revelation. I'm not going through and, and looking and saying exactly what's going to be happening, but just looking and seeing what we can learn as Christians today. And um, two most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible, in my opinion, are Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, because it explains about eternity and what we're going to be experiencing forever. Uh, really, really neat stuff. But let's start out here in verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And of course, the water of life there is definitely tied to God's written word. And we looked at a lot of these before, but we're going to go over a couple scriptures quickly. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. Just go to the previous chapter there in Revelation. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Okay? <clears throat> the water of life, God gives it away for free. Pretty neat. Um, There's only one Bible that doesn't have a copyright on it. And it's old account, crown copyright and stuff like that. Well, that's just to try to keep the, it from being perverted and changed and things like that. But you can read this book and quote this book and, and put out tracts with as much scripture in it that, that you want and things. Nobody's going to come after you. All right. The new versions, they have all kinds of little warnings and copyright stuff in them. And, and of course, they're changing them and reprinting them and all this other stuff all the time. You know, but they have all kinds of warnings in them. You're not supposed to take any more than your, you know, 200 words or something like that, I think it is, without express written permission from the publisher and things like that. King James Bible is free. You can use it as much as you want. Interesting. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. There's a lot more reasons why the King James Bible is God's pure word and the others are false. But that's just another one of the little evidences against the new versions. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27 it says here, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The way that you're purified is by taking a shower in the physical sense. If you're sweaty and, and you know dirty and whatever else, you take a shower. You get purified by washing your flesh in water. Well, in the spiritual sense, it's the same thing. Only it's not some kind of spiritual water as far as something that makes your spirit wet or something. No, it's God's Word. It cleans you up. You see, that's the whole point of when you get saved, uh, the Lord's going to come in and He's going to start to cleanse you and purify things out of your life through His Word. He's going to convict you of certain sins in your life, and he's going to say that thing needs to go. Why? Trying to clean you up. You come to the Lord not clean already, and then salvation. Oh my, no. You come as a sinner. In a repentant state, in other words. You're saying, I'm dirty, I'm filthy. Please save me, and then wash me clean. See, that's how that thing works. That's why lost people can't stand the thought of repentance and a changed life that comes after salvation. They can't stand that. They don't want to be cleaned up. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We're going to see another verse or two here on the thing of the word being compared to you know, water. John chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. The Lord said here, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, uh, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Yeah. What did we read back there in Revelation chapter 22? Keep your finger there in... in uh, John chapter 4, go back to Revelation chapter 22. Just want to get the wording exactly right. Or excuse me, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. 
And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Did Jesus charge her anything? There in John chapter 4. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. When is everlasting life? Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. Gives you a little bit of taste of what's going to be the start of eternity there, going into eternity. And it's tied to the Word of God. But people say, well, it doesn't really matter what Bible you use, and I wouldn't make an issue of the Bible version issue. And, and okay, it's just it's variations and nuances of translation. Oh, it matters very much. Very, very, very much. You say, how much? Psalm 138, verse 2. I'll show you how much God's Word means to him. Psalm 138, back to the Old Testament. Psalm 138, verse 2. It says here, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. How important is the written record of God's Son? Written instructions for you and for me. How important is it? More important to God than his own name. He said, do you have a good family name? That guy has a good name. He's known. He's a household name. A name is pretty important to a lot of people. But for the Lord, he says, no, actually, this word is more important. Far more important than his name. You're not to take the name of the Lord in vain. But people that, oh, I won't take the name of the Lord in vain, but they'll take this book in vain. They don't count this book as that important. That's a problem. Go back to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. Let's look at uh, verse 1. Because I wanted to establish the fact that this, you know, the Word of God, the written Word of God is likened to the pure, you know, water. Look at this. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. What's the water of life? We've read about it. It's the Word of God. Clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Wouldn't it be something if there was a river coming out of the throne that somehow, some way, was this book? We walk by it and instead of the the water rushing over the rocks, would it be weird if you could actually hear God's word being read, being quoted? Wouldn't that be odd? You say, how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things about eternity. I don't understand a lot of this stuff. Gold, the streets of it are gold, like under transparent glass. What is what is transparent gold? What is that? How about a, a city where the foundation is is all these different precious stones and things? I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne. I've never seen anything like it. But wouldn't it be weird if it was God's word in eternity flowing down through there and you walk by it and you hear the scriptures being read? You look in there somehow and you can see it, you know. I don't know how it works. I believe it. That's really all that matters. <laughs> Revelation 22, verse 2. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Rather interesting. God includes a tree in that city that yields how many manners of fruit? Twelve. Why is the number twelve significant? And what's it have to do with nations? Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. I'll show you the reason for this. If you're familiar with this ministry, you know where I'm going. But uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, 
verses 7 through 9. I have to repeat things because some people just stumble upon a video and they don't know what all the Bible teaches. And they've heard things and they've seen things and they've been taught things. And when you actually start to read the Bible and study the Bible, you realize how much you've been lied to in your life. And that's what separates this ministry from other ministries. Because I'm telling you, don't just sit there watching me. Get a King James Bible, the only true Bible for English-speaking people. Get a King James Bible and look up the verses and make sure that I'm telling you the truth. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning in verse 7. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. How many tribes in Israel? Twelve. Verse 9. For the Lord... Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So there are 12 tribes. There are 12 boundaries that the Lord separates people into. Why? Well, because God's a racist bigot and God hates certain races and he casts them down as lower people and all this stuff. That's a satanic attack upon the authority of Scripture. This thing of this whole, oh, you're a racist because you say keep people separate. You keep people separate to preserve their culture, to preserve their heritage, to preserve who they are. That's the whole point of separation. That's why God did it. Look at the verse, verse 8. When the Most High divided, He divided the nations? Yeah. When He separated the sons of Adam, He set the bounds of the people. Just imagine a farm and the Lord goes out there and He says, okay, and He puts fences up. And he says, that's the pasture for the sheep. That's the pasture for the cows. That's the pasture for the horses. That one over there is where we're going to have for the chickens. And that He separates. Not because he doesn't love certain groups or loves one more than the other or whatever else. No, he's just saying, I want you to be preserved with your unique characteristics and qualities. But Satan has been brainwashing people for thousands of years. Uh, he's been, brain, been brainwashing people uh, to believe that God's purpose of separating and things like that is somehow hatred. It's racist bigotry. It's segregation is this evil and stuff like that. It's, it's nonsense. Segregation is how God preserves people. Integration destroys people. And it's funny because God actually practices segregation in eternity. Hmm. It goes right back to the Twelve boundaries that he set back in the Old Testament before the giving of the law. Goes right back to it and says, that's how it's going to be forever. You have a problem with that. Some of these people, well, you know, I saw some somebody and they were just like, they, they heard me saying some of this stuff and they said, oh, you know, so many minutes in and I heard you say these things and I'm unsubscribing. Okay, thank you. Go away, you know. If you're an integrationist, I really don't want you on this channel anyhow. Uh, the fact that you hate certain people and hate certain kindreds and want them all blended and mixed together so that they disappear. Uh, you're not going to like this ministry. Okay, I believe in the thing of people being kindredly pure and separate. Not integrating, not all coming together and losing their culture. But it says there in Revelation chapter 22 verse 2 about the leaves of the tree will you know, are going to be for the healing of the nations. Let's see about that. Psalm 104. Turn your Old Testament to Psalm 104. And verses 13 through 17. We'll look about this. It's kind of an interesting thing here. Psalm 104. Verse 13. It says here, He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth good, or forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the, the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted, where the birds make their nests, and as for the stork, the fir trees are her house. Okay, and, you know, 
it amazes me. I mean, you could you could spend your whole life trying to study natural cures and and herbs and and wild edibles and all kinds of things out there. It's incredible, and I really believe that the cure for every disease out there is found in nature. But you see, you can't patent that. So that's why the big pharmaceutical industry goes against natural cures and things like this. You can't patent things that are growing wild out there in the woods that anybody can go out and pick. And you can't preserve it on the, on the shelves and things like that and, and whatever else. So man in his sin perverts what God made. And God says, I'm going to destroy the earth back there in the pre-flood days. They're wicked, they're evil, they're doing all this bad stuff. God sends a flood and the people die and they get smushed down and it's decomposing matter and material and stuff and it turns into oil. That's where oil comes from. It's decomposed plant matter and people and animals. And then they take that oil, dead people essentially, and they refine it and turn it into all kinds of stuff and they make you eat it and call it pharmaceutical pills. Life-saving medication. How vile and disgusting. You're on pharmaceutical drugs and many people are and hey, get off of them. Okay, but if you're on pharmaceutical drugs, you're eating dead people. If you want to get right down to the very clearest definition of the thing, petroleum comes from decomposed matter, as far as, you know, organic matter, uh, people, animals, plants. You're eating rotted, essentially, dead living things. And you wonder why it affects your health so negatively. It's really something, isn't it? But it's funny because there is actually, if you go back to Revelation chapter 22, there is actually a, it says about the tree of life. And today, the Latin phrase for that is lignum vitae, or viti, some people say vitae, but I've always said vitae. Um, and there's actually a wood, and I thought for sure I had it here yet. I didn't put it in storage, but I think I put it in storage. I'm not seeing it anywhere here, but I actually have a wooden mallet that I made completely out of a solid piece of lignum vitae. It's not a very big tree. It's, I think, down in the southern part of Texas, down through Mexico, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's, I think, oh boy, second or third hardest wood in the world, if I remember correctly. And, you know, really, really, really heavy, very dense. Um, and years ago, I found some at a, there was an exotic um, wood dealer down uh, below Quarryville, Pennsylvania. It's called Groff and Groff Lumber. And I used to go there. It was like dreamland for me as a wood turner. <laughs> and, uh, and they had, you know, these blocks, you know, like a four by four, inch, you know, 16 quarters, what it's called, um, you know, block of lignum vitae. And I was, you know, and it was really expensive wood. And uh, the one guy there was telling me, he's like, if you burn this stuff, he said, it'll produce a green flame. It's really wild. And um, it's kind of interesting because lignum vitae means tree of life in Latin. And the collar of the throne is green. So, I don't know. Kind of an interesting thing there. But uh, this, this lignum vitae, um, I was going to turn it and make this wooden mallet out of it back when I was a wood turner. And because um, I heard it's, you know, so hard and everything else. So, I have, in with a wood lathe, you have, it's called a spur drive. It's like these four little blades and then a little point in the middle. And then that goes into its tapered, uh, it's called a Morse taper, goes into the headstock and it it stays in there by friction. And then you put a tail center on so the wood is turning between these two centers. The one center has these little blades, you know, and then that goes in the spur drive and then that, that makes the wood turn and stuff like that without it slipping as you're applying your tools to it. A little technical there. If you're not familiar with wood turning, you're probably not understanding anything I'm saying, but <laughs> just to prove my point. And so... I'm like, okay, you know, I've, I take these solid steel spur drives and I just take a mallet and I usually just line up, you take a, a ruler and you go from corner to corner and you get like a little X in the middle of the block of wood that marks the center point. So you just kind of put the spur drive, you put the point in there and then the blades and you just pound it down in with a mallet. Sink these spurs into the back of the piece of wood. So I'm like, okay, like in Vitaeus, yes, yeah, so it's a hard wood, it's really heavy and stuff, but I thought, I've turned other hardwoods, you know, exotic stuff, coca bola and ebony and things, and so I put my spur drive there, and I'm whack, and I hear this, like, and I hear like something hitting the wall, and I'm like, okay, well, what on earth was that? I 
bang, and I hit again, and I hear something flying, and I'm like, what is this? And I pull the spur drive up. It literally broke the pieces of metal, the little blades. It broke the pieces of metal blade off and would not dent the wood. And I'm going, this thing, this block of wood is stronger than the steel, you know, spur drive I'm holding? Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, I guess I'm going to have to come up with a slightly different method of mounting this thing. And I was, I was scared to death to turn this stuff. I thought, well, if it's, if it's doing that to my spur drive, what's it going to be like to my, my gouge and, you know, scrapers and stuff like this, my different wood turning tools. And it was weird because as I was turning it, it was just, there's a, there's an oil within lignum vitae and it, it's actually a lubricating oil. And it was just like the smoothest thing that you could possibly turn. It was incredible. And you know, I get the thing done and it was just, I barely even had to sand it. And when I tried to sand it, it just, this oil just, you know, loaded up the sandpaper. I mean, amazing wood, never turned anything like it. And, uh, I actually turned a wooden bowl out of lignum vitae and I sent it to, uh, Peter Ruckman uh, many, many years ago and just thanking him for the work he's done and stuff like that. So, but my whole point is, um, Oh, and another thing I got to say quickly, they actually use lignum vitae. They'll make bearings for the shaft of the propeller shaft in some of the big boats. They'll, they'll turn it out of lignum vitae because it's as strong as steel, but it's self-lubricating. Fascinating wood. The, 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 God had created such amazing detail in nature and things like that. I mean, you're, you're a fool if you think that this whole world came about by random chance. I mean, you're, you're nuts. <laughs> um, no way. Uh, the... the you know, God's hand of, of creation is just all through nature. It's amazing. But this lignum vitae, I don't know if it's the same wood or not. I have, I have no idea. It does have some, you know, medicinal qualities too. Some, I think it produces like a red berry or something. Um, but it could be that that's just man's adulteration of, you know, taking the term tree of life out of here and applying it to a tree on earth and... Or maybe it's, you know, the, this lignum vitae tree will be there in eternity, or I have no idea. But uh, just very, very interesting um, with this whole thing. But just wanted to put that in there. I, one of you actually had contacted me and said, you ever hear the tree of life? You know, it's kind of interesting. And uh, yes, I have heard of it, and I have worked with it. Um, incredible wood. Just incredible. Um, I've worked with, I don't even know, hundreds of different types of wood over the years as a wood turner and things and wood carving and, and whatever else. And, uh, it's just so amazing. The smells, the, the textures, the, the grain patterns and, you know, just really, really a neat, um, thing to, to uh, get into. But anyways, let's continue. Verse three, Revelation chapter 22, verse three, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. Um, Wait a second here. Curse? There shall be no more curse? What the curse? Was this witchcraft or something? No more curse? What's that all about? Well, when did this uh, curse happen? Go way back. Let's go way back to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. And I will show you where the curse came in. All the way back, Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Genesis three seventeen says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb, herb, herb of the field. Some people say herb. Say it either way. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The Lord cursed the ground for his sake. Hmm. In other words, you're going to have to work really, really hard. And you're going to have times, I mean, real true gardening, uh, I've not done huge amounts of it, but I know about it. Um, and real true gardening and things where you're growing plants and whatever else, you're going to have some times of just total disappointment. You're going to come out in some 
stinking bug got in there somehow and just wiped out half your crop and you're going oh man you got to try to kill the thing you're trying to catch him and whatever else and you're i don't want to spray any kind of pesticide on there and and then you see weeds coming up all the time and you got to be pulling you weeding the garden and stuff did plenty of that as a boy growing up and uh we would you know that was one of our chores we'd go weed the garden and you know and and uh you know all of a sudden you're you're there everything's going great the garden's looking great you got you know your beans are coming in nice and you know you're getting some good ears of corn on there and whatever else and and all of a sudden there's a thunderstorm and you and all you hear the hail coming and you're going oh no and you go out after the hail storm and your plants are just you know shredded to pieces yeah in sorrow you're going to labor <laughs> You're going to have those neat times of, of, you know, really getting a good harvest and things like that. But a lot of times you're going to come out and be just, oh, man, we lost everything. We're not getting any rain. We had a drought. All of our plants died. You know, we had too much rain. It, you know, it, but the curse is gone in eternity. Interesting. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have uh, farming forever uh, where there aren't any bad bugs that come in? There's no too much rain. There's no this, there's no that. And what about the fact that in eternity, it doesn't get dark. The sun shines all the time. Can you imagine the kind of crops that would grow with sun? There's not 24 hours a day because there are no hours in heaven, but, you know, <laughs> nonstop sun, pure water, pure atmosphere, no more curse. Pretty good times coming up. But one thing I got to admit here, uh, verse 3 in Revelation 22, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh-oh. God and Lamb are different there. They both have their own throne, right? So that just debunks what the Bible teaches, that Jesus Christ and God the Father are part of the same body. Um, and I've talked about that. You can watch the different studies on that. The Godhead in, in Scripture is... Jesus is the body, God is the soul, Holy Ghost is the spirit. In him all the fullness dwells. The Bible talks about it over in the book of Colossians. In Jesus, in other words. That's why Jesus said uh, to his disciples at one point, he said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He's talking about the soul that's within him. So, again, another big study. But right here, this must debunk it, because you have the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's two different thrones. Keep reading. Verse 4, Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. That's one. And it doesn't say it's not two there because it was just a comma or something. No, it's a semicolon there in verse 4. So it's talking about they shall see His face, the Lord's face, and His the Lord's name shall be in their foreheads. It's not saying His, God the Father, and then His, Jesus' name. It's not talking about that. And if you look up at verse 3, actually you can see it right there as well. His servants shall serve Him. So it gives God and of the Lamb, and then it says His, singular. It's dealing with one being. Not three separate gods up there walking around. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh-uh. There is no such teaching in Scripture. You show me one verse where Jesus is called God the Son. There aren't any. One God. You see? That's how that thing works. It doesn't say, and they shall see their faces, and their name shall be in their foreheads or something. It doesn't say that. His. It's singular. Rather interesting. Just had to put that in there. Verse 5, Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Huh. Can't wait to be in a place where it never gets dark. I like the nighttime for sleeping, you know, and if there's some fireworks or some other kind of neat thing that you can see, lights and stuff like that, but it's I like to see light <laughs> at night. But just... uh dark things and just go for walks in the dark and whatever nope not for me 
I like bright sunny days. I love bright sunny days. Uh, that's eternity. Forever and ever and ever. Bright sunny days. I'm looking forward to that. John chapter 3. Speaking of light, let's go to John chapter 3. There's an old saying, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Heaven is not what you like on earth times 10 up there. Uh -uh. Uh, you don't get to, if you'd like to go fishing down here, you get to go up there and you got to, if you have an acre lake down here, you get a 10 acre lake up, up there or something like this and a uh, bigger bass boat up there and whatever else. No, no, that's not heaven. Heaven is about Jesus Christ. It's about worshiping him. Yeah. There's a lot of people that wouldn't like heaven. Let me show you the reason why. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know what you're going to want as a Christian? You are going to want to have God shine the light into the dark places of your body and your soul and your spirit. Lord, show me what's going on. Show me, Lord, as much as I can take. I want truth. You show me what things I need to get rid of in my life. That's the prayer of every Christian. That's why we got saved. You see? I'm a mess, I'm a wicked sinner, I'm rotten, my life is going nowhere fast, I'm about ready to blow my brains out, God please save me. And he saves you, and then you say, okay Lord, clean this mess up, can you please clean this mess up? Mm -hmm. And the Lord starts to shine lights in there. And sometimes it's rather uncomfortable. You know, sometimes uh, you might have a light shine into a place and you go, well, I kind of feel kind of weird here or whatever. And you shine a light back there and you go, oh, whoa, there's a really bad sore there or whatever else. You know, that's kind of uncomfortable to think about. Yeah, but uh, it's better to know about that sore or whatever thing so you can fix it up. Sometimes the Lord's going to shine the light into your life and he's going to say, you're not living right. You're not doing right. You better clean it up. And we're going to live in eternity in a place where it doesn't get dark anymore. And like I said, there's going to be a lot of people, they don't want that. They don't want to live in a place where there's just blinding white light all the time. I do. I can't wait for that time. I don't want to live in a place where there's a bad part of town. You got to kind of avoid that and stuff there. And, and it, you know, you, you walk outside and it's, it's kind of dark and you're like, I don't want to walk down that alley over there. Is, that, is there some shadowy figures? In nope, not in heaven. Can't wait. I just cannot wait for that time. Back to Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Hmm. These sayings are faithful and true. Can you say that? Do you believe that this book is faithful and true? You say, no, it's just the one I prefer. You're wasting your time. If your truth is what you prefer, uh, you're, you're way off the mark. Uh, truth is something quite oftentimes that you don't prefer. <laughs> uh, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to find that out. There's going to be a lot of times the Lord is going to shine that light into your life and He's going to say, this is the truth. That's bad. You need to get that thing out of your life and it's going to hurt to get that thing out of your life. But uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to make a point here. You say, well, I don't, I don't know if there is such a thing as a true and perfect and pure word of God and the one that's faithful and true and things. Um, 
Yes, there is. And I'll tell you right now, people are not going to die for a book that they don't believe is faithful and true. Let me show you here. Now, this has been the reality of, of saved people for a long, long time. And uh, I'll say a few more things about it. Talking about the heroes of the faith here, Hebrews chapter 11. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to fight, turned to flight, excuse me, the armies of the aliens, women, in other words, people from other boundaries that came in, they weren't dealing with people in spaceships, okay? They're dealing with people, you're from another, one of the 12 boundaries, stay out of my boundary, okay? Those are the aliens. Get them out of there. <laughs> That's what it's talking about. Verse 35, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So you go through torture, knowing that you'll obtain a better resurrection? How would you know that? Hey, you need to give up that King James Bible, okay? Because if you don't, we're going to put you in prison. We're going to torture you. And then what are you going to do? will kill you. Uh, well, then I get to go to the place I'm reading about in Revelation 21 and 22. Eventually, you know, we're going to get there. I get to go to heaven. You see? You can torture me and kill me and murder me, and I'm going to go through it knowing I have faithful and true promises in this book. And my eternity is fixed. I'm going to go to that place someday that I'm reading about there. I know I'm going to obtain a better resurrection. If I die as a martyr for Jesus Christ, that's going to be rewards for that. I'm going to go to this wonderful place. What's the problem? And it's so funny to me how hypocritical a lot of these new version people are. They'll come out and they'll say, well, you know, um, the, there is no such thing as a perfect translation. And there's this. And they repeat all this stuff that they've been taught. And then you say, so you don't believe in the Word of God? Oh, yes, I do. The Word of God is my standard. They don't believe it for one minute. It's really something. But let's continue here. Uh, verse 36. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They were doing all this stuff before Jesus even died on the cross. So for them, it's like, okay, we've got to go down to the Abraham's bosom. We're going to be down there waiting for the perfect Lamb of God to come and you know take away our sin. Our sin's covered by these animal sacrifices that we're doing here in the Old Testament, keeping the Levitical laws and all the other stuff. But uh, our sin's not taken away. Our sin is taken away as Christians today. Completely washed clean. All our sins. And we are part of Christ's body. And yet how many Christians are really willing to take real strong stands for the sayings that are faithful and true? Well, what would my family think if they found out that I was King James only? It's really something. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 25 through 26. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto, e unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. But uh, how are you going to follow the Lord if you don't believe that his sayings are faithful and true? Well, my professor said, well, my Scholars said, well, my Greek text said, well, my lexicon said, well, mm -hmm. or you can just look like an idiot, just like a uh, King James Bible believing Christian and people go, ha, 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 look at the stupid uh, backwoods, you know, whatever else and backward and all. St 
whatever. <laughs> you got to get through that stuff, brethren. You got to get past the point of caring what people think about you. Go back to Revelation chapter 22. And it's ironic because when you try to preserve your character and you try to make yourself look good, you still fall flat. You try to save your life, you lose it. So you might as well just give up yourself and say, okay, Lord, you saved me. My, my life is yours. You tell me what to do. You shine the light of truth into my life and shine it on those bad things that I need to take care of. And I'll trust your word, Lord. I'll trust the book because I know it's going to carry me safely through. It's worked for over 400 years. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Very interesting because there are three times in Revelation chapter 22 when the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. Interesting number. But uh, you say, but it doesn't make any sense. Behold, I come quickly. You know, we've been waiting on the Lord now for all this time. Well, yeah, but uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says about, you know, one day with the Lord is, is, as, a thou, is, is as a you know, thousand years, okay, for us. You know, so a thousand years down here, up in eternity, it's just like a day. So literally, the Lord's like, okay, it's going to be, you know, not quite two days. I'm going to go up to heaven. He goes up to heaven, and he's up there, and he goes, okay, uh, about two days, I'm going to come back down there. I'm going to get my saints, get them out of there. A little bit of time there, time of Jacob's trouble. Seven days. What is that? A couple minutes in heaven. Okay, let's go back down again. <laughs> you know, it's really something. Behold, I come quickly. Well, if you go up Acts chapter 1 and you say, I'll be up here for about eh, two days, then I'm coming back down, that's pretty quick. That's not much time. We tend to look at it from our perspective and go, why is the Lord waiting so long? He isn't. It's quick. Not much time. Pretty incredible. John chapter 20. Go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 26 through 29. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless. Words are faithful and true. Hmm. But believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus is both. Verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Did you know that there's a special blessing upon you as a Christian today, living right now, because you haven't seen the Lord? You know, and how many times, you know, you just get like, if I could just see the Lord, if, he, I, if I could just talk to him face to face, and I wonder, then you'd lose the blessing. And isn't it ironic that the men that actually did see him and did know him for three and a half years, walking with him, they knew him very, very well. They slept there, you know, out in nature and things with him. They ate with him. They walked with him. They ministered with him, all these other things. And yet he dies on the cross, comes up, resurrected, and they're going, I don't think it worked. I, don't, I guess he wasn't the one we were looking for. They're doubting him. What makes you think you'd be any different, Christian? If you could see Jesus Christ physically. Hmm. Let's go back to Revelation 22. Verses 8 through 10. I'll show you something very interesting here, actually. Revelation 22, verses 8 through 10. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. 
Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. You say, well, what is this all about? Uh, was the angel just some kind of a heavenly, you know, the angels and things that were created at the beginning of the, you know, before the foundation of the world and things. You read about that back in the book of Job. They were called sons of God back in the Old Testament, the angels. Uh, was he just one of those? No. We're dealing with somebody, says there in verse 9, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets. So you're dealing with somebody that lived in the past before John and now they're up there in a redeemed body and they're called an angel. That's why Jesus Christ talked about in the resurrection they are as the angels of God in heaven. All right? That's going to be what you'll be in eternity. So now who is it? Well, this is just a theory. I'm not going to teach this thing doctrinally and if you don't believe this, you're, you know, whatever, you're a heretic and probably not saved or something. No, just a theory. And actually I got this from uh, Peter Ruckman and things, so I can't take credit for it. <laughs> not like I really care, but, you know, the whole point is um, some pretty interesting things here. Who is this? Well, it's very interesting because it actually shows a little bit about how God deals with sin, right? Sin that you do as a saved person. The Lord has a way of getting the last laugh. Let me prove it to you. Go back to the book of Daniel. What are the two greatest books of prophecy in the entire Bible? Daniel and Revelation. I believe that this angel that John talks to there in verse uh, 8 down through 10, I believe it's Daniel. Let me show you the reason why. Go back to Daniel chapter 2. Lord has a sense of humor. It's just amazing. And uh, I've seen this thing in my own life. How uh, I've done some stupid things and the Lord will, you know, make some event come up in the future, you know, years and years after I've made my mistake. And it kind of like brings up my mistake and it gives me a chance to correct the dumb thing I once did. And here he does it to Daniel. Let me show you. Daniel chapter 2, verse 46 through 49. Okay, here you have Daniel giving the interpretation of the dream and things in the previous part of the chapter there. Verse 46, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. And Daniel stopped him and said, King, don't worship me. God was the one that gave me the interpretation of this dream. You worship him. Don't you dare bow down in front of me. Is that what he did? No. Verse 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal the secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many gift, great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king, became a big shot. Did he say anything about the uh, king? You know, I, I don't want to make you mad because I know you got some anger issues there, but, you know, being the dictator of the world and all, you know, um, but known world at the time and everything there, of course. But uh, you really shouldn't have bowed down to me, okay? That's, you're taking glory away from the Lord. Didn't say a word. Just kept his mouth shut. So the Lord in his sense of humor, you go back to the book of Revelation, and what happens? And I, John, saw these things, verse 8, and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Okay, Daniel, here's your chance. Now you get John falling down before you and worshiping you. Nebuchadnezzar did it. He worshiped you, fell down, worshiped you, and you kept your mouth shut. The Lord says, okay, here's another chance. It's an eternity. <laughs> Look what he says. Verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not. <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been wanting a second chance to write this thing now for a long time, thousands of years, you know. And see, thou do it not. Don't you bow down to me. Interesting thing there. But look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 22, verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. 
seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. How does that tie into Daniel? Go back to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. Daniel speaking here, he says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up un and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. We'll see that here as we continue in Revelation 22. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in the lot, thy lot at the end of the days. He's standing in his lot at the end of the days. And the Lord says, Daniel's going, I don't understand what's going on here. And the Lord says, seal up the words of the prophecy of this book until the time of the end. Revelation chapter 22, verse 10. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. I believe firmly that it's Daniel. Like I said, I'm not going to teach it as sound doctrine or whatever. You know, it's got to be Daniel or something like this. But comparing Scripture with Scripture, I believe it's Daniel. And Daniel's there and he says, first of all, he's like, whoa, okay, don't fall down and worship me. Bad idea. I kept my mouth shut way back when. I shouldn't have done that, you know. But uh, don't fall down and worship me. And by the way, uh, don't seal up the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Seal it not up. In other words, the time's at hand. Here we are. Just found that interesting. Verse 11. Remember how it said there in Daniel chapter uh, 12 about, you know, the wicked shall do wickedly and, and things like that. Look at verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Hmm. The things that you work hard at doing in this life are going to form habits that go into eternity. You say, what? No. Huh? What? Really? Yeah. Absolutely. The reason that you're getting rewarded in heaven for what you've done in this life is because what you're doing in this life with what you know the Lord has given you right now, it's going to continue on into eternity. I firmly believe that. If you're messing around and just kind of carnal and whatever else, well, the Lord's not going to entrust you with much responsibility in eternity. If you're willing to serve the Lord and be righteous, you know, show forth His righteousness through your life and show forth, forth His holiness through your life. If you say, yeah, true and faithful are the sayings of this book. Well, you're going to have a good place in eternity. Hmm. I want to read a quote here by a secular philosopher because what he's saying is true. Ralph Waldo Emerson. A good saying here that he says, and I'm not, you know, people hear me quote somebody like this and they go, oh, he says, you know, he's for what he's saying. He made a good quote. <laughs> okay. Let me read it here. So a thought and you reap an action. So an act and you reap a habit. So a habit and you reap a character. So a character and you reap a destiny. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? And I've seen that. Some of, sometimes these philosophers, they're just so far out there, they're messed up, you know, going to hell and trying to justify sin and whatever else and get rid of the Bible and standards and things. But every once in a while, they'll just come out with some kind of profound statement and it's just like, yeah, truth. Why? Because the Lord is showing that He has control over everybody. The Lord can speak through anyone. And just take that person and say, say this. Okay, good. I've seen that thing. But how interesting. And I agree totally with what that saying or what this you know thing is there. This quote, sow a thought and you reap an action. You start to think about it. The thought life starts to go astray. And before long, you want to act on that thing. So an act, when you do act on it, and you reap a habit, all of a sudden it starts to be, you go, hey, that wasn't too bad. That I, I thought it was going to be really difficult to do this or really bad or whatever else. You try it, hmm. 
You try it again, and you try it again, and you try it again. All of a sudden, you have a bad habit. So a habit, and you reap a character. You become a drunkard. You become a filthy, fornicating slob or whatever else. All kinds of different things that you can become. And that's your character. So a character, and you reap a destiny. And of course, he was talking about, you know, you're going to end up dying early or something like that. I don't think he was referring to eternity there. But as a Christian, I can read that and say, yeah, you're right. You will reap a destiny. People have these funny notions. Well, you know, I have I like to, you know, kind of party and, you know, kind of do some things down here, you know, and stuff. Well, you know, when I get up to heaven, I, I'm not going to do that. Um, what makes you think you're going to go to heaven? You know, if you're enjoying the darkness things and the, the wickedness and stuff like that, what makes you think that you're all of a sudden going to change and get to a point where you say, ah, I don't want that stuff anymore. Well, you're enjoying it right now. Hmm. Well, let's continue. Verse 12. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. Quickly, number two, in other words. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, of course, what's the reward? Well, you say, well, the judgment seat of Christ. Sure, absolutely. Millennial reign. Absolutely, that's true. But there's another reward that Jesus brings with him when he comes quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I keep putting my hands in my pocket, by the way. If you're seeing, going, saying, what on earth, you know, why does he keep putting his hands in his pocket? It is, got a thermometer over here, uh, 61 degrees in here right now. Um, don't have any heat upstairs. And uh, does not feel like it's 61. That's up, temper, the thermometer's up there, so it's probably actually down in the 50s. And uh, rather chilly. The wind chill factor is below zero right now, so... Uh, excuse me why I try to keep my hands warm. <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, behold, I come quickly. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Get back to that in a minute. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, how do you know that? Only if you believe that you have a faithful and true sayings of God. Hmm. But uh, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Judgment seat of Christ, millennial reign, sure, absolutely. But how about the reward of getting rid of this? Corruptible body. All the pain, the suffering, the headaches, the nausea, the vomiting, the tiredness, the inability to sleep at night. And over. And again, you compare this to what goes on in the gospel accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The sun is dark and the moon turns to blood. The stars from, fall from heaven and they look up, they see the sign of the Son of Man coming. It's, that's not the moment, the twinkling of an eye. You just compare Scripture with Scripture. You see, this is a different event. Plain and simple. This is something that happens like that. The Lord coming quickly. Boom. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. It's an eye blink. Do you realize, no matter what you're going through, the health problems, the financial problems, the whatever you're going through, when the rapture happens, it's going to be, hear your name and you go, huh? Blink your eyes. Blink your eyes, close your eyes. If you go like this, looking down at your old feeble hands or whatever else, and you're looking down like this, blink your eyes, open your eyes. You're with the Lord. You look down at your hands and you say, where'd the wrinkles go? 
boy, I feel good. <laughs> I'm not thinking about sin. Wow. No, no achiness in my, in my knees when I go like that. Where'd, the, where'd that pain in my hip go? <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. Not quick enough if you ask me, but uh, <laughs> uh, looking forward to this. How about, let's go back to Revelation chapter 22. We don't think about that. We think when he brings his reward with him, we're thinking, you know, well, the judgment seat of Christ and the crowns and the millennial king. But brethren, I'll tell you what, it's going to be a real treat, a real reward for this corruptible to put on incorruption. This mortal to put on immortality. It's going to be nice. Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus says eternal life. You say, well, you know, Jesus mean you mean Jesus gives eternal life. No, he is eternal life. And when you plug into Jesus Christ, when you say, okay, I want to be saved, and the Lord saves you, he looks at your case, so to speak. He examines your case and he says, Are they coming to me? And just saying it just to repeat the thing, and they're they're just going like, you know, Lord says, empty your pockets, and you go, Oh yeah, it's all it's all out, you know. And you got a bunch of things in there yet, and the Lord just goes, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Using that as an analogy. A lot of people do that. The Lord comes and says, are you a sinner? Well, you know, I guess technically everybody's a sinner. Yeah, but what about your personal sins? Is there some guilt there? Is there some contrition? Contrition means I'm sorry for my sin, and I want to do something about that. I feel I owe God, you see. And it's not, well, you got to perpetually do works to uh, you know, eventually possibly be saved. Oh, no, 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 no. It's you coming as a sinner in reality and saying, in humility, I'm a sinner. I want to be saved. God, would you please save me, a vile wretch like me? Please? I don't know how to live for you. I've tried in the past. I've tried to do things. I don't know how to do it. You, could you please show me? Could you please shine that light into my life? And show me what's wrong. That's salvation. Go back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Jesus says eternal life. We just read that in verse 13 there. The beginning and the end. Colossians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 12. giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In light. See how it all you know, just ties together. It's so amazing. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hmm, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. What's translated mean? Moved from here to there. One day, we're going to be translated. Going up. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus is the invisible, or the image of the invisible God. That's why he said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's what he's talking about there. No man hath seen you know, the Father at any time. What's he talking about? God the Father is the soul. He's inside of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about there. Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All the most powerful beings and creatures and things and these, you know, fallen angels and whatever else, you know, and things that are out there controlling the politicians and whatever else, they're all created by Jesus Christ. They're all subservient to him. And you're worried about what again? Verse 17, and he is before all things, Alpha. He's before all things, and by him all things consist. There's not one thing in this universe that can take another breath unless the Lord gives him permission to do it. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, uh, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. The living saints on earth, things in heaven, those saints that have died in the past, and they're up there, soul and spirit is up there, waiting for their body to come up. How incredible.